The foundation of human understanding teaches an observation exercise, often called meditation, which permits you to become objective toward your problems and allows your heartaches, bad habits, fears and anxieties to be completely eliminated from your life without effort on your part. Until you have begun to practice this exercise, much of what you see and hear on the following program may be shocking and upsetting to you. But if you will listen calmly and with an open mind, you may discover the key to the peace of mind and joy for which you've been searching all of your life. And now from the foundation of human understanding, here is Roy Masters. Okay, welcome once again to the program. Roy Masters is talking about you. And this evening and every other evening, every evening this week, possibly going for two weeks, we're going to discuss meditation. And it's a very mystical subject, shrouded in, well, uh, controversy. There are many different kinds of meditation. The, you know, there's the Rajneesh kind of meditation, and there's the Hare Krishna married meditations, and there's Buddhist meditations, and there's uh, Hindu meditations, and there's yoga meditations, and then there's Roy Master's meditation. And now, a long time ago, I imagine that all these ma meditations have a common origin. And, um, and a long time ago, the meditation was more innocent and pure. But, you know, the sects and the religions and mingled with philosophies and ideas and concepts have somehow perverted the ideas of meditation. So many ideas, many concepts of meditation have emerged, many methods. There is only one correct method, and no other method is correct. And I claim I have found that method. I was never satisfied when I was a young fellow. I was never satisfied with what was shown to me. I was always searching, but I had a keen sense of knowing what, was, what wasn't right. I can tell you, if a plumber comes in with his bag of tricks and, opens, and picks up his tools, I know he isn't a plumber. When he, the minute he starts to work, I know he, whether he's good or not. I can tell by just the way he talks, yet I don't know anything about plumbing. I know what isn't it. And if you've been going from church to church, from synagogue to synagogue, from cult to cult, looking for something, and, you, and you've never been satisfied with, with it. And because the reason was, there's something in you compatible only with the truth when you find it. It knows it when it sees it. It takes one to know one, you know what I mean? And uh, so therefore, there's something in you that knows. I have to tell you a little story. Did I ever tell you the story about the guy that was on the parade ground walking around picking up pieces of paper? It was in my unit, my, my army unit, and he, he was picking up, it happens to me, me. <laughs> picking up pieces of paper saying, that's not it, that's not it, that's not it, no, that's not it, and throwing it down, and this goes on for weeks. Finally, they send him to the psychiatrist, and they figure he's not very well, you know, so they, they signs this little piece of paper. He said, that's it. <laughs> See, he's discharged. He knew, he, he knew what it wasn't it. See? And there's something in us that knows what isn't it. See? But actually, we really know what it is, but we can't define it. See? There's, there's a, it's a spirit. It is a, um, a spirit that, the spirit of, of searching and yearning is only compatible with, the, with, the, the, with the, the truth of the way and the way of that learning. And it only feels comfortable with that. And you'll see, if you start to meditate, and a lot of you already are meditating, um, that that's absolutely correct. And as you start to meditate and discover, come closer to yourself and realize more about what truth is, to know what it isn't, so you can reject it more fiercely, see? Uh, you'll begin to understand me better. And I know, uh, uh, nobody really can argue with anything I say because nobody really know, can, well, I, I'm, I'm skilled, and I'm disciplined in my logic, my spiritual logic, so you may not agree with me, it's only because you're not yet on the path or you're not far along so you can't see the point what I'm saying, but you can't argue against it. Never had anybody argue against it, what I'm saying successfully in all the years I've been on radio. 
or television. I haven't been very long on television. Now, I remember when I was very young, meditating. As a matter of fact, children, when they're very young, meditate. And they don't even know they meditate. I remember when I was in the army after, you know, 20 mile march. And the blood came through my, the, the lace holes of my boots because my feet were so raw. But I remember lying down on my bunk and uh, closing my eyes and then feeling my hands tingling. You ever felt that after a hard day's work, you sort of, it's like a reward. If you haven't worked honestly and had done a, haven't done a hard day's work in a right way, you can't meditate, you can't relax. Because the other guys, they couldn't relax. or well, they did smoke beer. I mean, smoke to smoke beer. <laughs> the devil made me say that. <laughs> well, they smoked cigarettes and drank beer. And, uh, and you ate candy bars and played cards and tried to watch TV or whatever it was. Listen to radio and told dirty jokes to each other just to try to, you know, relax. And because uh, meditation is a form of relaxation, and it's for the deserving. People that don't live right can't have any rest and don't deserve any rest. They try to create their own rest, their own peace. Uh, two kinds of meditation, uh, well, basically two types. One, you know, um, coming towards truth and reality, coming towards your conscience, or peace with the truth, you know, like uh, surrender, peace with it, being at peace with oneself. And then there's the other kind of meditation, which is peace apart from yourself. See, the ego has no peace, no rest. It has in conflict with the self in becoming prideful and ambitious and, t and sort of sinking into the world and taking on the identity of life, of the sustaining affections of life. Uh, living in this sort of, living out of this hypnotic trance, moving blindly towards whatever it is their hearts desire. They have become different. And this difference is conflict. And conflict is the difference between what we were or could be and what we become. It's vain striving. Follow? So this part can never have peace with God because it's not ready to come to God. Therefore, it has peace apart from God. Therefore, it gets deeper into hypnotic trance. So therefore, many meditations are simply hypnotic trances, a deeper and deeper hypnotic trance. So you, so you see people you know, imagining and um, uh, repeating mantras, you know, Mazel Tov, Mazel Tov, Mazel Tov, whatever it is they say to themselves over and again. <laughs> you know, in every way and every day I'm getting better and better, it's a lie. <clears throat> and they keep repeating things to themselves, get lost in some nonsensical word because if it had a, you see, if you had a word that made any sense, eventually to come back to the meaning, your mind, it's hard for you, it, it's hard for your mind to sit still because your mind lives in association. One thing leads to another, and leads to another, and pretty soon it comes back to what you don't want to think about. So you, a nonsensical no noise, a word that has no meaning at all, is given some kind of meaning later on. But it's simply hypnotic. You focus your eyes, mind on that, and you keep repeating it to yourself, and the pain goes away. That's because you're moving away from the pain. You dig? See, does that give you some idea? That's a hi hypnotic. Most meditations, all of them, as a matter of fact, all of them without any exception, even Buddhist meditations, are hypnotic. And, and that meditation shouldn't require any structure. You shouldn't have to go to, to, to the, the uh, Dalai Lama and sit in front of his feet and spend seven years d with rituals and learning the discipline. You shouldn't need any of that. You don't need any structure. You don't need to be in a monastery. It's, if the minute you have structure, you have external authority. The minute you have external authority, you have a hip submission to external authority, and you're submerging yourself in the hypnosis of life again. See? And you're be becoming subject to a, 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 not a wrong spirit. The whole idea of meditation is to be subject to a true and pure spirit, and purifying spirit. And that's what you're searching for, isn't it? To, to be infilled with, the, with what the Creator has purposed for you. And, and you, a lot of people get stuck in those different uh, outposts of reality, you know, and on, the, on the farther horizons of reality. They can't get back. Um, 
it's possible that you will, you could get caught up with Roy Masters. It's possible that you get caught up in my, pal my personality. And that try as I will, as hard as I might, that some of you are so externalized, so used to attaching yourself to some hypnotic personage and, and involve, uh, losing yourself in their personality, in their charm, in their approval, in their methods, which they invent, see? That there's no chance once you get caught in these people whose intention is not to free you, but to lead you to some kind of false concept. It's so easy, so easy, these other meth methods of the Rajneesh and uh, what's this little smiling fellow that uh, there was the guru of the, of the uh, Beatles? Yeah. Uh, Tia, Maharishi, yeah, Maharishi. I hadn't, couldn't remember his name. Yeah, but um, it's so easy for a person to get caught up in these different systems, as I said, that, that uh, it's very hard to come back. And it's possible that you get caught up with me, but I, I wish it not. See? And, and if you're sincere, you, you may find yourself caught up with me and the meditation. But the thing, the meditation has something in it for your best interest, because um, I understand the, um, uh, that, uh, that I'm a kind of a Moses. See, uh, uh, with Moses was a type of cheese, Jesus. There's got to be some teacher, some kind of person who has found the way and who's, who survived the system, like Moses survived the system and Jesus survived the system, didn't he? And he, the, the survivors get through. And of course, these survivors are very threatened, the powers that be, you see. Always, because the powers that be, they don't want you to find yourself and be true to yourself. But th th we are like a Moses, so for a while you have to follow somebody. But the point is, you will recognize the qualities of those you can follow. And, and if you're true, just like the person on the parade ground, you know, this is not it, you'll know that I'm it. Instinctively, you'll recognize where I'm coming from, and you'll know that the instructions are right. right. And it's as though I've been reading your mail. As, so as I speak to you, all I'm doing is reminding you of what you've already known. Now, for a little while, um, it's quite possible that you will be intellectually learning me. And that's not too bad, although if you get stuck into learning me, simply learning verse and chapter, reading my, studying my books and getting lost in it, you will be able to remember everything. And th that is not what I really want for you to learn. I want you to understand which is a higher stage, a higher level than just learning it. But it's okay to learn it because eventually you can say, ah, oh, now I understand what I know. And then some people get stuck at that stage of learning and never get beyond it. And they get very frustrated. See? And um, so, are there any questions at this point? Um, yes, there's a question back there as a gentleman. Yes, if you wouldn't mind, please, you can stand up. Yeah. Okay, now. Now, yeah, you can it's just talk to me. Oh, that's all right. Uh, I wanted to ask a question. Uh, I've been meditating for like six months. Yes. And um, I'm finding that I don't have any interests, and I'm growing kind of tired of people. I am too. <laughs> but still, I don't. I, I still love people. Well, it's not it's everybody, but just the people that are. In the s moving in the same direction as me, I, I'm able to spot them more easily, and they warm up to me and I to them, and I have a, a, a nicer relationship with the people, the world outside myself, only them, namely them, not anybody else, you know, to help with everybody else. <laughs> maybe, that's, that's, maybe that's what's happening. Yeah, that's right. So don't be afraid. I mean, you're going to be attracting people like yourself, and, and, and it's fortunate that you do, because Otherwise, you get, you know, you go to bed with dogs and you get up with fleas. You tend to get involved with wrong people if you don't have that discretion to pick them out and for them to spot you, uh, you know, and uh, kindred spirits. You, uh, this is the reason why we have problems in life, because you can't see what those people are up to. You think they're your friends and they're not. And you see? And, and a whole of life is communication. See how beautiful it is for us to sit here and you haven't been talking yet, but you will, I hope, and to talk to each other and to, you know, to flow one to another with love and understanding and not be a stumbling block to each other's growth, 
and not simply not me talking to you like two people in a restaurant entertaining one another. And he said that to me, and I said that to him, and he said, and I said, and the person sitting there fascinated, and each one entertains the other. Each one informs each other, but only as a means of distraction, with not anything meaningful passing across to each other that would be helpful to each other's lives. And we, we love each other for that distraction, for that trivia, song and dance, that soft shoe that we put on. We love that because it, it's the hypnotic state that we we enjoy being in that peace apart from God and others provide for it. That's just one form of it. Baseball is another. Med ch church and religion and, and meditation forms are another. But it, I remember I'm a hip professional, used to be a professional hypnotist. I really understand hypnotism, but I, don't know, I know both sides. I know both sides. Are you satisfied with the answer, or you want to? Uh, yeah, I think so. I was, I was just going to say that it seems like there's a, a lot of pain involved when you're meditating. Like I, no, no, not meditating. In, you know, in that kind of, I feel like sort of the isolated. I mean, yes, you do. You know, and it seems like there's a lot of, I mean, there's a significant amount of pain involved. Not bad pain. But, yes, yes. But Isolation. You know what I mean? Like yes. sort of a, a, I don't know if it's a searching or. A, or something inside, but it's... Well, you're not compatible with the things that people do anymore. Yeah. So right. they think, they, they look at you, they can see you looking at them, they can see that you found a space that's not theirs. And you're looking each other, uh, each other across a big chasm, right? Yes. You know, them in their hell and you in your heaven. Because basically you are in a heaven state. See, you're basically in this objective state where you're not involved with your feelings and not involved with your emotions or, and reacting to things, then people can't get to you. They can't get inside you. They can't have their way with you. As people much. don't have any use for you if, they, if you don't respond to them and if they can't act through you. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I do. And then you can't also, by the same token, you can't, if you're not, if you're not involved with each other, you can't counter, counter act and also have some advantage. See? In other words, when there's no emotional bond between people, there's no way that any person who is of the wrong caliber can have any advantage of you at all. For instance, if you were married and you suddenly, as a man, you would suddenly find yourself a little bit more distant and objective, having learned your lesson by, by involving yourself with feminine poptitude or whatever they call it, you know, feminine charms, and having got too emotionally close to a woman where she has got inside you and is able to take liberties. Huh? You understand that, don't you? But if you ever found a, that to be the truth, and you p pull back, and you found yourself involved with, with the, the right spirit, subject to, to the spirit of God rather than subject to the spirit of the woman, then she would, you might find that particular woman very disturbed, see, um, and uh, angry with you, and, and, and telling you that you have no feeling and no love, and make, trying to make you feel guilty about being detached somewhat aloof and business-like, you see? Because they, she, her spirit would not be able to have an advantage over you. Oh, there are other women that would love that. They would admire that quality in a man and quickly seek to dialogue with this new found strength, see? So that she might also be detached, but this time detached from her own feminine identity, like the, the, the witch identity that's lurking inside that seeks Seeks not men, seeks that tries to keep men from becoming objective. See, <laughs> see, so um, you will find that the world itself is going to think you're cold and crazy, and they will think that you're crazy for seeing. Them. They'll sense that you're looking at them because you have an, a look that awakens. Don't you have a, f a feeling when you listen to my program that it's almost like shocking? Uh, not so. Not only the things I say; it's the tone. <coughs> is the ambience, isn't it, of what I'm saying. So you, as you grow, you're going to become very powerful. And you're going to be powerful not only with good people, but you'll be powerful over bad people. You'll be powerful with good people. You know, it'll be a good power, because the power will always be to help them to their higher good. But the, but the power will be over the bad ones. Isn't that what we want in meditation? It's not an egotistical power. They just can't touch you. And the more they try to hurt you, the more they end up hurting themselves. They end up stinging themselves to death like a scorpion. 
I know what you mean. See? Yeah. They can't poison you, and they, the poison stays within them. And all they have to do is stop trying to poison you, and the poison won't accumulate within them. And you see, you won't have to try to hurt people. But we're getting a little bit away from the meditation. We're getting more into the philosophy. Are there any more questions about this? Thank you. Uh, anything else? Because oh, I could take it a little further. It's hard to think up questions because see, what it is, you tend to be caught up with me. That's why you're so following me so intently. You say that's all right. Go ahead. Um, I've been meditating about two months, and I've noticed a lot of changes um, in myself, and a lot of things that have been problems have sort of just dropped away. That's it. You know why that, that is? <coughs> it's because you're identified with a different uh, spirit. And then you're taking on the character of that spirit, which cannot have a problem. <laughs> you see? But I have a new problem. <laughs> All right. And that's that in the last two weeks, I have, and I don't know, you know, what's purely physical or, or I don't know, but I have gotten so anemic and sleeping. Oh, that might be. Sleeping and. That and might be, if, if it may be some shortage of the right food or something. We need to talk about that later. It's not really in keeping with what I want to talk about this okay, evening. Okay, I have a question All right. specifically about the meditation. Yes. In your book that comes with the meditation tapes, you talk about changes that you'll notice in your body. Um, you think that might be part of a change? Yeah, I just I wondered if you could talk a little well, bit about Well, I, uh, I once had a, a conversation with a person who started to meditate. and He had occasion to go to the doctor to have a blood test. And... Um, for some, I don't know, he, he was scheduled, I don't remember the reason. And w when he came back, from the, when, the, when the test came back, the doctor said, he, he, according to the test, he's dead. <laughs> no, I don't know what that meant, but he couldn't make head and tails of what was going on. He'd never seen anything like that before, like he was from another planet. And it's quite possible, I, a person who comes in from the cold, you know, comes in from the world, having been worldly, uh, all his life or her life starts to meditate. A lot of psychological and, and metabolic changes are taking place. I've never really measured them, and uh, especially in the first, uh, you know, the stirrings of the experience. So it's quite possible that that's what it might be. It's only conjecture, or the other you may have a problem as well. Um, now we've got five minutes. Does it, does it seem like a half hour went by? No. no. See? And that's another interesting about uh, being in the spirit. Um, this kind of interest seems to be eternal. It seems to have the quality of no time. And when you're in that frame of reference, um, you are in sitting with me talking about higher things. You are automatically through following, simply saying, listening with interest. That the fact that you listen with and can follow you do not realize that you have been transported to a state of meditation. Listening to a person, of my knowledge, my awareness, brings you into the state of awareness. Um, if, as, you, as, you, as a parent, as a brother or sister, or husband or wife, your awareness will heighten the awareness of those around you, those who are willing, but sharply conflict with those who are not willing you'll have a lot of persecution. See, they, they, they react to you and your conscience, your innocence, your evolving innocence, the same way as they tend to react to their own conscience inside. Except they can kill their own conscience, deny their conscience. But how can they kill a living, breathing person in whom there is a conscience? And there's a tendency for you and me to awaken people to a conscience they don't want to experience. So they will feel like you're, you're giving them pain. They feel like you are cruel, that you're hurting them, and may even succeed in give, causing you to give up meditation as a, because you may think that you are, whatever it is you're doing is, is hurting them or killing them. But you mustn't give them up. You mustn't give up whatever it is you're doing because you see you're not doing anything wrong. You have to be very strong. You know. There's a passage in the scripture that um, references that, is that uh, blessed are those who are persecuted, reviled, you know, put down, 
called all manner of bad names for righteousness sake, for, for such are the kingdom of heaven. See? So you see there is a, you must understand that meditation is going to bring you to a very pure state and uh, it's going to take all the fun out of life, but it's going to put new fun back into it. See, I mean, happiness to me is not needing anything or anyone to make me happy. I'm free. If I need something to make me happy, then more happiness means I need more. And if I need more, I'm not free. So there's the unhappy conclusion of everybody who thinks in the, along those lines. So just not needing something means I'm f I've found something, I've transferred to something that gives me a fulfillment instead of the outer, it's the inner. And after all, isn't that what we're made of, the inner, not the outer? Isn't the problem with life what we're made of the outer, not the inner? Isn't that the conflict? They've metamorphosed a new being. We've displaced uh, our spiritual essence like the petrified tree, which having its original form has lost all of its original atoms, you know, to the mineral content of the thing that it was immersed in, the, the, the rivers of, of water that it was immersed in. Now, uh, you've been immersed in life and you've been displaced. And naturally, you, you, so even your own body will groan because there's a part of you that hates the truth. There's going to be a, a pain. Meditation is going to be painful because when you sit down, you feel like you want to run, run out of the room. And uh, with that, I will leave our discussion to continue tomorrow night, which is, is just f uh, 30 seconds from now for the audience. So, uh, How your mind can keep you well is the primer. And at the end of the program, Please make note, ladies and gentlemen, and write to the Foundation if you can't afford the meditation, which is the book and three cassettes. So really all you need. And watch these programs every Monday night, Monday through Friday, and be in the audience and call the Foundation, the phone number's on the screen, and all the information on the screen, and support the program financially. Um, appreciate it very much. Part two is next. Hello, my name is Roy Masters, and we're talking about meditation. And I'm sorry if you missed last night's program, and, but they, they're available, the programs are available, ones you've missed, and uh, on videotape and audio tape. I'll give you the information at the end of the program, but uh, I did uh, issue some warnings about meditation, some of the dangers. So with that, I'll have to dismiss that portion of it, and we'll go on to uh, what meditation is now. Now, um, remember I said yesterday that, uh, in the last program, to be more honest about things, um, that meditation can be hypnotic, and meditation mostly is hypnotic, and that it's no damn good if it is, because then you become subject to the, the teacher, and the will of the teacher, and the philosophy will come up in your mind as if it was you were discovering it. If you hypnotize a person, a very interesting phenomenon about hypnosis, remember I said I was a professional, but if you hypnotize a person, uh, invariably, that individual, even though he's fully aware of the suggestions given him in the hypnotic state, he is not aware that he's been hypnotized. And even the hypnotist can't make him believe that he was, because he doesn't feel any different. But his consciousness has been altered nevertheless but he doesn't detect it. See, just when a person takes a drink, his consciousness is altered. You still feel conscious, but you can't drive as well. And you don't say the right things. You see, the right things try to come out, and the wrong ones come out, right? Then you excuse those wrong things, right? See, you start to defend what's coming through you. So hypnosis does that. And the personal presence of an individual, a powerful authoritarian figure, and a teacher of hypnosis, meditation, who's really a hypnotist in disguise, in, you know, in, in Far Eastern garb, uh, can actually induce you to have ideas which you take to be your own and defend them to your death. Well, the drug addict is the same way. He defends those who have hypnotized him with drugs. And they don't realize they're being acted through and serving another source. They still think they love and they th they, their loyalty is taken to be, 
their compulsions and slavery is taken to be on from their point of view as loyalty. And same with your friends, they hypnotize you the same way. You, you need their love and you, you, you buy into their hypnotic support. And you, your consciousness is altered and, and you feel comfortable in their presence. Everybody who makes you feel comfortable in their presence is a hypnotist. Or they make you uncomfortable until you learn to do the tricks they want you to do and then they make you feel comfortable. And again, they hypnotized you. You don't even know it. But coming back to the hypnosis itself is that you've got to be very careful of people like Maharishi and, and uh, the various Hindu and the um, yoga practices, because bless you, that because you're buying a philosophy and you're buying into a, another god religion from the netherworld. All their gods are all from the other world, see. Originally, I suppose, it started off with the real one, but, you know, things being what they are, the church, you know, the church started out that way too, and most people are caught up with the church and not worshipping the Spirit of Christ through this image, because you're not supposed to have any graven images. What, what, what churches, for example, have images when the Bible clearly states no graven images, none whatsoever. But yet they put those images up there. Why do they do that? Because they want to offend the conscience. Little children, people coming into those churches. It's, you, if, you go into a, in, if you go into a church with images, especially Catholic church, you can actually feel sick and be afraid. Ever been sick in the church? Because of certain spir spirits present there? Well, but the, but the, but the, the uh, images, the statues, uh, shock the senses. They assault, and you, have, and you have all these authorities preventing you from standing up and saying, well, this is something wrong. They won't let you say something wrong. They won't let you speak up. Any authority that causes you to react and not let you speak up eventually overwhelms you, and you become subject. And as you grow older, everybody who is like the father or mother you hated becomes the authority, and pretty soon you, you cow down to them, and you find yourself doing what they want while hating it all the time secretly, but professing to love it, hypnosis. See, now I got away from the hip meditation again, but that's hypnosis. And you don't want, the, the, the Christ said something very good about teachers. He says, you should call no man father. You should no call man no man rabbi, teacher, or, or father, rabbi, and what a leader. For you have no, you know, you have no. Your father is in heaven and your Holy Spirit is your teacher. Everything you want is within you. And you, you, you don't need any leaders. And yet you call your people leaders, and you call your priest fathers. See? It's all against the very things that, very against the very principles that I'm trying to bring you to. Now, this is the reason why Roy Masters has a churchless church, in a sense that, um, that this, is, this is the kind of teaching, the mystical, esoteric teachings, that the church has, has, has factored out with all their pomp and ceremony, and that's why Christians are nothing but robots, for the most part. There are a few sincere ones who have simply made it on their own and loved the Christ on, in their own way, in their own discovering. He discovering them and them discovering him. See? Um, but I am going to bring you to that way. And in a sense, I am the way to the way. I'm not the way. I am the way to the way because the scribes and Pharisees of modern times have simply blocked the way and won't let... Remember what he said? He said, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you brainwashed, uh, you whitewashed tombs, you, you know, dead men's bones. He said, you have the key of knowledge, but you don't enter into yourself. And you stand in the way of everyone else that wants to come in through the door. Right? So this is... And this is where it's been for centuries, and only in America, blood, sweat, and tears, we sit down on television and talk about these things. And you know every one th word I'm saying to you is true. The, the religions out there mostly are simply, well, they're not false, but they're, it's like your government, your bureaucrats, they're, they're not real either. They don't administer the laws with love. So they, they, they try to get into the halls of power to administrate those laws, so, to be the power. So you've got the right, you've got, the, in other words, he says, do what they ta say, but don't be like them. Didn't he say that? Do, do, do as they tell you. They're saying the right things, but uh, be careful, don't become like them. And if you react to them, that you'll become like them. 
or you'll rebel against the teachings. You say, if this is God, I want nothing to do. If this is religion, and if these are God's preachers and priests, I want, well, there can't be any God, so I'll become an atheist. I'll go to hell, hell in a handbasket. If, if, everywhere around you, there's trickery. And people don't know, even realize themselves what kind of mischief they're perpetrating. They're not even aware of it. But I'm trying to make you aware. Now, what we have to be careful of is hypnosis. You've lived in it. You've, you've grown from it. See, you've lived in a hypnotic state all your life with outside teachers and leaders, and now you must have the teacher within. Any questions before I go any further? Yes, sir. I find that the... Um, Could you please stand so we can oh, okay. see your... I find that <clears throat> the problem with consciousness is that we're not conscious of everything. No, you can't Our consciousness be only goes so far at any given time. Yes, of course. And if we become... Now, what I see you doing, Roy, and what I've heard you do over months and even perhaps a, a year or so on the radio is you try to wake people up to themselves as self-conscious human beings. Obviously. And, I fi and uh, this, this is one of the things I find that that is good because this is, uh, we need the, this, this waking. We do. We find many forces today try to keep us asleep from, from this yes, waking Yes, so that's up. the point I was making, yes. On the other hand, the consciousness as such isn't the only thing. No, I didn't say it was. I'm only taking one step at a time. You know, I can't cover all the knowledge in the universe in just uh, one leap. So if the consciousness is emphasized too much, we, then one it becomes cold. And in this coldness, there enters the other adversary, the adversary who is not, quote, the spirit of the woman. Well, forgive me, forgive quote, me, forgive but me. The spirit of hold the man, a, if hold, you want to use yeah, that Hold a second. I feel like I'm being preached to. Okay. So we sit down, please, and I'll, I'll take it from there. Thank you. Um, see, I know what he's saying, but he's starting to preach to me, and I take offense at that, if you don't mind me saying so. And um, um, I'm not above learning, but we're getting away from the... Pr I am talking about consciousness because we've got to begin somewhere. See? And of course, the more consciousness, the more understanding. The more understanding, the more you find understanding, realization, shows you how, where next to extricate yourself from, from what predicament. See, because you don't see all the predicaments you're stuck in, and you don't see exactly how you are stuck. And of course, if, every time you raise your consciousness, and every time you see a predicament you're stuck in by that raised consciousness, um, then you are extricated from it just by being aware of it and not being angry with it. See? And then the minute that happens, you are freer. And, you mo the more you, and you've obeyed, you've obeyed the, the purposes of, of that higher impulse. You've grown. The higher will has acted through you and you've, you've grown to be a better person. As a result, is you're now, you are now uh, set up for the next realization. And each realization shows you more error about yourself. And so, as you see it, you see what you've never seen before. And so that you discover. And as you discover error, you also discover truth about the error, and one enhances the other. For instance, if you have light and no dark, there's no picture. <laughs> there's no, truth is not all light. Uh, it, one, it helps for one to have uh, a black and white picture, for example. A white sheet of paper has no picture on it, unless you have dark. And so from, from the light, you should see the shadows, and you see the outline of things, and you see the false and the truth. And you see the truth by the false, and the false by the truth. See? <laughs> Got it? And that's how you learn. And your appreciation of truth is enhanced. You say, aha, now I'm more conscious of this. And so, but it's a mostly a wordless thing, and you cannot share it with those around you. And um, so, we are looking now to raise consciousness. And meditation is the first step to raising consciousness. For here we have a problem. And the problem is, must be understood, because the minute I talk about it, you'll understand. First of all, the problem that you have right now is that you're hypnotized by your own thoughts. The moment, moment you close your eyes, you're daydreaming. You daydream long enough, you fall asleep. Right? 
You know, you start drive, driving, driving down the highway and you get a little sleepy, but watch what happens. You start to think about something and before you know your eyes are closed and you don't know they're closed. Because the daydream can pull you away from consciousness and yet you, you'll find yourself caught up watching a dream and not watching where you're going. And you don't even see that your eyes cl closed. And all of a sudden you're off the highway, aren't you? So, see, now you're caught up in internal, internal thought. Here is where we begin. We close our eyes and we start to observe our thoughts. But we will also observe, the first thing you observe in your exercise of observation is that it's very hard to observe, th observe, observe thought. It's very hard to do that because no sooner you do it, you're asleep in them. See? <laughs> Your thoughts are so powerful that you're daydreaming about something and you've forgotten to be right in the moment. So don't get frustrated that you don't, are not able to keep this up for very long. As a matter of fact, I can do it, I can keep myself from falling into my thoughts maybe a fifth of a second. And I've been doing it for 30 years. So maybe 30 more years, I'll have two-fifths of a second. <laughs> it may accelerate at a certain point. But if I can do it, if I can stay out of my thoughts completely, I'll be walking on water, guarantee you, without a sheet of glass underneath. <laughs> the goal is to be completely... But now there's another kind of thought that ev evolves from not being involved in thought, and a kind of thought that you can be involved in. See, there's, in other words, I could, my wife knows when I'm driving down the highway, when I'm slowing down, I'm thinking. But I'm not thinking like you're thinking. Because a, an idea has just come for me from above. And I'm involved in thinking with it. But I'm not lost. I'm found. See? I'm savoring what I'm... Th it's not the thoughts which come up from underneath to distract you. It's the, north, it's the thoughts that have come from above to save you from distraction. See, because you do have a mind and you do have an intellect and you can do, look into your thoughts and contemplate on the thinking which is from above. Now, where shall these thoughts come from, from above? Where do they, where, where, where do they come from? When, where, when do they come? They come when you're washing the dishes. They come when you're riding your motor scooter. They come from when you're having sex with your husband. What the hell am I doing this for? <laughs> sort of thing. <laughs> this is ridiculous. <laughs> you all smile because you know those thoughts. <laughs> anyway, they come in odd moments. You wake up in the middle of the night where there's these thoughts. Sometimes you think them all night instead of dreaming. But they will come, and you don't have to be in a library in a monastery to to have these thoughts revealed to you. And the nice thing is they come from d in your daily, daily life and your daily activities. And, and even you see a, see a leaf falling onto the ground and, it, and you've got a thought about it, which you never had before. And these are principles of life. And these thoughts become expanded into almost every avenue of your everyday affairs. They teach you every... They, you, you can't believe that a falling leaf could teach you something. But it can. And your thoughts, your th will have, you'll have plenty of thoughts. You won't be a blank slate, which leads me to the point where you're not supposed to meditate. The idea is not to have a blank slate. The idea is not to concentrate in such a way that you blank your mind out. Think of nothing. If you think of nothing, you're thinking of something. It's nothing. It's a, if you think of black, it's black. You're thinking of. See? You don't want to stop thought. Because if you stop thought, you stop discovery. You stop seeing what's behind it. If behind every, every thought, there's an experience that brought you t that thought to you. Somebody you listened to that you shouldn't have. Something you believed. There's always a memory of that time and place. Ah, I shouldn't have listened to that fellow. Now I know where my problem came from. See? And we're not touching on belief yet. I have a whole line of thinking on belief. 
But we're just talking about the simple mechanics. So any, any questions so far? Oh, good for you. John, I thought I was going to go the whole through the program. No one's saying anything. Okay, go ahead. Just, just look at me. When I'm meditating, yes. and I don't see the thoughts coming into my head, but all of a sudden I realize I'm in a thought. Right. Thank you, I'm daydreaming. Right. And then I come back to That's my it. center. That's, That's all okay. there is to it. I don't see the thought coming. I don't see it go by, but I, all of a sudden I realize I'm, I've been thinking all about right, let's something. Let, let, let's, let's, let's play with this idea, shall we? Okay, mm -hmm. everybody for a minute. Would you d would like to do a little, little exercise? <coughs> you just close your put your hands, um, put your hands together on your lap, or you put one hand on your side, like this. And just for a minute, you could, I'm not going to do, do this very long, but if you close, you close your eyes and be aware of your hands, just be aware of your, I'm not going to do a meditation, I'm just going to go do a little, uh, just a little bit, two or three minutes worth. Just be aware of your hands. See now, if it's one hand, just be aware of your thumb and then shift your attention from your thumb to your first finger and shift your attention to your second finger and third and just keep doing that as though you're looking through the middle of your forehead and stand back and, and see your thoughts. And it's as though you're looking through your mind's eye and you can almost see your hand sitting there and you can almost see almost down your arm and, and you can sort of flow down into your arm and feel where your hand is. You see what I mean? Now, you, you, you hang on to that concept as though you're looking through the middle of your forehead, as though, don't try too hard, don't try at all, just do that, stand back, and be aware of your hands, or both hands, and if you're using both hands, the center, the, the, your palms will become warm. And try to make your hand warm just by holding, either shifting your attention from one finger to another, or making, if your hands are in prayer-like fashion, just feel the warmth passing between the palms of your hands, and just be aware of that warmth. And as long as you can be consciously looking at your thoughts and dispassionately observing them and letting them go by, as long as you do that, um, your hands will stay warm. But the trouble is, you're starting to think, float. Now, the e it's easy when I'm talking to you because when you sit and meditate with no one teaching you, you have no anchor. Your anchor is only inward, see? But right now it's a little easier, but you see your thoughts trying to get between you and your hand. Can you see them? You're trying to think. All little distracting little thoughts, music, everything flows in, and it tries to pull you. All you have to do, without frustration, just stand back and say, oh, looky that, as if to say, looky here. I'm, I'm thinking about this, and I'm thinking about the laundry tomorrow, and washing the car, and whatever worries you have. But, and just pull back and let the thought go right by you, and Try to stay there, but you can't stay there very long. You may even forget to be aware of your hands, in which case your hands become cold. Stress. That's just a normal stress state that you've been living in. But the whole idea is, now you can open your eyes now. Um, do you feel a little more, more rested? How many people feel more rested from that two or three minutes? Interesting, isn't it? Well, uh, and you probably didn't stay in your center more than a billionth of a second, if you could measure it. Because the minute you start to stand back, another one's going to, uh, that thought will disappear and, and, and you cut the tie. You cut the energy you've been giving in it by being compulsively fixated. See, your problems have been, you've been compulsively concentrating on your own thoughts. And you've been caught up in your own thoughts and, you, and your thoughts, wherever they come from, they haven't come from the real you. They've come, come from your emotional reactions and your, your slavery to your environment. See? So, they have got your mind captive, your consciousness captive, in a lesser state of consciousness than it ought to be. And so, therefore, the idea of this exercise is to free you, or to become free, and to realize that you're not free, that you are a slave. In other words, to be more biblical, a slave of sin. Because that's where you end up when you do something wrong. That's your mind and your emotional thinking is where you take refuge. And we'll be talking, how much more time we got? Four minutes. Four minutes, okay, well, I'd like to spend four minutes, if you don't mind, in addressing the, the, my a pitch to the audience because I'm sure that people have just tuned in and have missed yesterday's program. Our first segment would be interested in getting to know more about what I've said. It, it's almost essential information. and. Uh, 
It, it's available on compact cassette. And, and every week, every day this week, the program will be available. If you miss it, it'll be on, available on audio cassette and video. And the video is $50, and the audio is 20 but you can copy these programs if you're fortunate enough to have got it from the very beginning for, for nothing. But if you wouldn't mind, please remember that information is all I have to sell you. And I'm giving it away, and I'm not making it, I'm not making it so that you have to come to the foundation you know, to have a course. I'm giving it to you for I'm not holding anything back. There's nothing to come to the foundation for, and if you don't have the money, I'll give you the book and the cassettes to teach you how to meditate for no charge at all. So what more can I say? Now it's up to you. Will you be a sport? See, will you be a gentleman or a lady? Isn't that what's wrong with us? I mean, how many people hold back when they know they should pay someone? I know when I... <laughs> I know when, when, I, when a person is doing a job, I, I put mentally his money aside for him. Most people are not like that. They won't pay, they hold back. See? And they try to get as much as they can for free, but it doesn't pay, especially in this kind of work. If you can't afford anything, and if you're not getting any benefit from this program, then fine. You didn't get anything, you don't give anything. Isn't that fair? But I'm giving you this, and if you buy it, you know in your heart whether you bought it or not. So I want it to be a gentleman thing, because that's all we have is honor. And honor is just between you and yourself. And you know when your motive is not pure. You know when you are giving to get, don't you? In your own heart, you know it. This situation must change. You must learn to give from love and do the right thing, even as I'm doing with you. See, technically, I'm taking a great chance because, for the most part, most souls, well, the only way they've ever done anything right is through pressure. I mean, the, the, the Tammy Baker and the Timmy Baker, what is Timid Baker? What is, <laughs> the mouse, I call him, the rat. <laughs> I mean, that's all he's ever done is motivated people to give him money. But somehow people buy into that because they have nothing in themselves, very little in themselves to make them do the right thing. They have to be made to do the right thing. You have to make them into little Christians. They have to have an external force acting on them to be generous. See? There's no plate being passed around in my church services. See? This is the only church we got. And if you want to give, you do. If you don't, you don't. That's up to you. And that's what makes you a strong person. You do without anybody breathing down your neck. That, and you'll see the freedom which comes from that. It's integrity. Self-esteem. Now we, we're just going off the air now, so you have to save the question till tomorrow, the next segment. But here's the book. We don't have the money, and at the, uh, on the screen at the end, you will be shown where to write. And please support the program with your contributions, because so far the, the sales of these it's, it's so inexpensive. It isn't like two hundred dollars or thousand dollars. We're trying to make it within the reach of an average person. And if the average person can't pay it, we give it to them. $33.50, three cassettes in a book. I mean, the cassettes themselves, you know, cost, plain cassettes cost that much. Anyway, thank you very much for listening and join us tomorrow night with, for our next segment. Part three is next. The foundation of human understanding teaches an observation exercise, often called meditation, which permits you to become objective toward your problems and allows your heartaches, bad habits, fears, and anxieties to be completely eliminated from your life without effort on your part. Until you have begun to practice this exercise, much of what you see and hear on the following program may be shocking and upsetting to you. But if you will listen calmly and with an open mind, you may discover the key to the peace of mind and joy for which you've been searching all of your life. And now, from the foundation of human understanding, here is Roy Masters. Hello, welcome to uh, Roy Masters is speaking about you, and I'm him. <laughs> and we're talking about meditation, and we've had a couple of very good sessions on the subject, and I'm very sorry that I've sort of taken the floor. And I do encourage everyone who's here to interrupt me at any given moment. I know I can sort of go with the flow, but it's good. I don't mind starting out with a question, if you'd like to stand up. And thank you very much. Okay. Um, 
I'd like to get back to the thing of uh, where you think it was either uh, where you thinking positive thoughts or negative thoughts, or whether thinking is good or bad. You, you're asking me whether uh, whether you think positive in meditation, whether you're supposed to think. No, when you're not meditating, <coughs> I've I've heard you say before that you know you have voices talking to you, and sometimes I do have voices talking to me. And I know that you shouldn't listen to those voices. Oh yeah, but, the, but, that's, but an, that's a subject for another time. That's right, not meditation. Right, but, but what I'm, I'm getting to is um, uh, the meditation is supposed to stop you from, from thinking. No, now, no, no. I heard no. you say earlier that it's okay to think, that it's good to think. But when is it good to think and when is it not good to think? It's always good to think. So, but, but and you to think allow yourself thought. Is it good to think when it's positive and even good to think? No, even if it, you see, when you meditate, what you want to do is to release yourself from the fixation to positive thoughts, which are lies. See, when you, when you have positive thinking, you're only booing yourself up, you're lying to yourself. See? So you have a lot of reinforcing emotions, emotionalized thought, which gives you an illusion of yourself. You know, you know those p people who have rose-colored glasses on who see good in everything. They're very aggravating people. You know? You s you have little old ladies who see no heart, no bad in their children at all, and the children can be committing crimes, and they and the police will call up, and and they go down to jail, and they can't believe their kid did that, and even when they when they bring them out of jail, they can't believe that the kid did anything wrong. So even though the evidence is right in front of their eyes, because they don't believe their eyes anymore, they only believe what they really what, what they keep thinking. See, that's their reality. Now we must be very careful about what we believe and what we think, even if it's positive. Even, even the, what, what we have tricked other people into thinking about us and believing about us, which we believe when they believe it, you see? We make them believe and we believe in what we've projected. See, we believe in them when they believe in us and then we believe in ourselves. And we have many structures which are false. So we don't want positive thinking. We just don't want it because positive thinking is positively wrong. Okay? Well, you see, you just keep on reinforcing something that isn't true. I'm wonderful, I'm great, I'm healthy, I'm well in every way, and every day I'm getting better and better. Lies. It's a hypnotic thing. If you keep thinking about that and thinking about that, and every day I'm getting better and better, and every way I'm getting, I'm looking in the mirror and tell yourself this and tell yourself that, you keep doing that, and you've you got a mantra. You've got something you're mumbling to yourself, it doesn't matter what it is. It could be chicken soup and noodles spaghetti and meatballs <laughs> and you whatever it is it doesn't mean that what it, the effect of of mumbling positive things to yourself is simply to distract yourself from the truth which makes you feel better you can sniff glue and do that see anything that's hypnotic it, it, when you eat something when you go to the refrigerator and eat something the moment you put your little choppers into the chicken sandwich, the moment it comes in contact, you know, with all the electrodes of your teeth and everything and the saliva, a little electricity flows and you've got flavor, that you, 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 you can be into that flavor and away from your guilt, into the feeling, away, and it gives you a feeling of security. Now, of course, what happens is you get fatter and you get a bigger problem, and then you look in the mirror and you're worse. And now that you see the reality, you get so upset that you rush to the refrigerator, eat, a, eat, and for a moment, a fat person in front of the refrigerator, eating a turkey sandwich, does not, is not aware that he's fat. You forget that you're fat. You forget there's anything wrong with you. See? And then you're enhancing the very problem that you looked in the mirror and got upset about. See? And you see, what it is <coughs> that any kind of um, fixation to any thought form at all, any feeling, any emotion, produces a distraction, a fixation, so that we're not, we lose consciousness or we alter our state of consciousness so, and it relieves the tension between us and the truth. If you're standing in front of a judge and he's about to sentence you to death, you're going to be very tense and very guilty, and feeling very terrible. But if a big windstorm came along and blew the judge and jury away and you stayed there all by yourself, you say, wow, I'm free. <laughs> <laughs> See? 
So what you've done, what you're always doing in your positive thinking, mantras and, and, and fixations and being fascinated, well, when a man sees a woman's form walking down the street, he goes, Sometimes the women's form is so strong, you have to hold onto the table. They go that way. You know, <laughs> you know they pull, they, they draw. They draw a man's tension away from himself. And that's why he feels relief. You understand? It's a, reduce it to its basic simplicity. When a person has something very powerful to hold his attention or her attention, to draw it, to pull on it, it pulls it away from conflict and you feel redeemed. But it's usually something bizarre that it enables, it enables your lower nature to fix, fix into that, lock into it, and to produce thoughts later on that you can think about later and they still will hold your thoughts. Your consciousness can still be holding the memory of those experiences. And that's what we're dealing with with meditation. We have a lot of thoughts uh, in our mind as a result of um, using drugs, um, sex, um, eating a lot, positive thinking, emotional experiences, fantasies. We have found many ways to excite the consciousness so that the state of consciousness is altered by an involvement with some mental fascination, so fantasy fascination fueled by experience. Experience is also fuel the fantasies and the fantasies create the experiences again and it goes round and round and you're locked into that and you are fixated and these work for a while to give you a feeling that you are you know you're happy you're having you're partying as one of those experiences and you get the idea that everything is going well because you can't see that it's not well but sooner or later tragedy starts to come upon you see and it's imperative that you unlock because unless you unlock you cannot see a real solution to anything. Right? Now, go ahead. Most everything you're mentioning right now has to do with pleasure. Pleasure and, and be love-hate. Uh, sort of, if it feels good, don't do it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably right. See, um, but you see, the discretion, some things, some things, uh, for example, naturally eating is pleasurable, right? And I don't have to tell you what the other thing is. But the trouble is, um, the normal functions of the body, which are naturally pleasurable, like you eat a nice um, steak, or I don't think that's nice anymore, but you eat a nice uh, cheesecake. I don't think that's nice anymore. <laughs> I'm, I'm growing out of all that stuff. A slice of turkey. Yeah, just a slice of nice... I don't think that's nice. <laughs> but anyway, you know what I'm talking about. A piece of mince pie or apple pie or something like that. And now that's okay to eat it so long as you're not going in after the flavor. As long as the food is not acting as a hypnotic fix, then that kind of deliciousness, it's salty and sweet or whatever it is, tart, mixture of those, those sensations, as long as you can just taste the food in your mouth and it's delicious to you and you eat it and your senses tell you that it's not poisoned or bad, see, tainted in some way, so long as you're not into it for its effect, its, its effect, its fixate, its mind-altering effect, then you can enjoy that in a very natural way. But the trouble is human beings use everything they use everything, every sound, every sight, every taste, every smell, every movement, every experience to, to hypnotize and to alter the state of consciousness to create the kind of fascinations and fixations which give relief to guilt. See? It's what they call distractions. They pull. And, but the net result of all that, see, in other words, you have two pleasures one pleasure which is natural and one pleasure which goes beyond being natural and once you start to do that then you can no longer eat properly you can no longer sex properly you can no longer breathe properly because everything you do you can't no longer go to the toilet properly you may get too much pleasure from that don't laugh because it happens see 
You know, you don't, you don't go to, the, you don't go wee wee for a while, and man, it feels good. <laughs> and don't you tell me, it, it, kids learn to get pl more pleasure from that than they, they deserve to feel, and that leads to other strange feelings. So, it would be a guide. Pardon? Something that you enjoy would be something to watch to be careful. Something you enjoy is like let's start with food. Yes. Sex. Don't get into it too deeply. Because after all, it gets into you. And what gets into you requires that you not look at it. And that you fix your attention away from seeing it for the relief of the guilt of it. Who understands me? You do. So in other words, we, our natural affections are ne have become perverted. You've got to be careful of loving someone too much. Being too kind, which gives you a good feeling. We're getting away from the meditation concepts. But you've got to be careful of even the, the concept of being kind to someone. I love too much. That's what's the matter with me. Well, if you love too much and everything is going wrong, it's because somehow you're not being businesslike about the business of loving. You haven't, got, it isn't a measured love. And it isn't appropriate love. It's some kind of weakness. It's some kind of fascination with being fascinated with. You see what I mean? The fascination with being, having people fascinated with your goodness, which is really nothing form of more than slavery. See? And then if you have an illusion of being good when you're really a slave. But you won't believe that, so you make yourself more of a slave to create the illusion of being good. Who understands me? You do, don't you? So, you see, now, again, we're coming back to the meditation. We're in meditation, we're trying to defocus. That's the word. No, we're not concentrating, actually. Concentrating is is not the appropriate word. When I make my next meditation, when I do it again, I haven't changed it for 20 years, but I'll just change the word to defocusing. But uh, for all intents and purposes, what we're doing is we're closing our eyes and we are uh, concentrating on our hands, either one hand or both. We, we start out in the, in the beginner's meditation with one hand uh, on our lap or by our side, and we're concentrating on one finger at, one finger, uh, bring our attention from one finger to another, as we were doing in the last session. The high idea is to create, to create an internal foundation. In other words, we don't want anybody reminding you that the meditation is going to teach you, but then you're not going to need the, the tapes anymore. You're going to use the tapes as long as it takes to do what it may take you a few months. It may take you a year. But after a while, you have to learn to do the meditation on your own. But what we're doing is trying to create a flow of energy from the inner person to the outer person. See, now, there are two ways that energy can flow, and I won't go into the psychodynamics of it, and I'm sure doctors can explain it better than I can. But all I know is there's an inner flow from the mountain to the sea, and then if you, oh, it, uh, your whole life has been one of overreacting, of course, which has cut you off from, your, from uh, the ability to flow from within to the without. But instead, the without flows to within. You react, you feel, you think. You think, you feel, you act. It's bypassed reason. You react, you feel, you think. You think long enough about something and pretty soon it becomes feeling. And feeling become, becomes, motivates behavior. See? You think about sex, you think about food, look, you're going to go pretty soon, you can't handle it, you're going to go into the refrigerator, you're going to eat, aren't you? So, something's wrong. And, and as long as you have react, you feel, you think, and, you, and thinking explodes in your mind, people can imply and make you upset, imply something, and you, you, you know what they're telling you without words. It will become a motivation, and you feel, and you you think about it and think about it and be upset about it and pretty soon you're acting it out. Now that's not the way to live, is it? Because then you're an animal. But you know you're an animal, but what knows you're an animal and it's supposed to be a human being is the real you. So, so it's like a, a telephone communication. If I'm talking to you in Denver, it takes me to talk into that phone, a me me mechanism. I need electricity and a wire the nerves, and then a receiver on the other end to hear it. So when somebody, re when you react to someone, what you're doing is the connection is to them, their mind to your mind. 
And so therefore, their mind explodes in your mind and you're a receiver. And, and that's what I call hypnosis because most people who react learn that way and they learn to be the result of people pressuring them. So they're, all they are, they're just reflections of their environment. And if, you're born in, if you were born in Borneo, you'd all be nice cannibals with bones through your nose because you'd, you'd be molded by your environment. And you wouldn't think anything of it because you'd live in that hypnotic state called culture. See? And so now this, this unsavory state of affairs has always felt as conflict because you are, have another potential higher than that state of affairs. And because you do, you're born to that destiny, you will be in conflict with what this system of things, react, feel, think, think, act, react, think, no, react, feel, think, think, act, well, I'll get it right in a minute. <laughs> you know what I mean, right? So, um, that's the conflict. So now, what you have to do is withdraw yourself from the whirlpool of your thinking. Remember, once you start to react, feel, think, think, feel, act, once you start to do that, that's what causes guilt, because you're growing out something other spirit, which has caused you to pull you from your first estate, is now act, acting through you. And you're not you. You say, what came over me? What got, it got under my skin? I'm not myself lately. Well, who the hell are you if you're not yourself, right? But you say things like that, because as if to say something, something's wrong and you're, not, you're developing a wrong identity. We'll come to that side of the meditation um, later on. But you see, the fact that you react, you feel, you react, you feel, you think, and you think, you feel, you act, um, produces guilt. And now what happens is, the only way you can get rid of the guilt of the soul is either to surrender to the truth and to find the truth to set you free from that, or not to know, not to know that this, this whole system is wrong but to become stubborn, but to lose yourself in more reacting, feeling, thinking, thinking, feeling, to, be, to become involved with the intensity of all that, and to intensify it, to purposely get reactions, to look for things to upset you and excite you, so that you can be involved in it and feel, and use the hypnosis of that not to feel guilty, but it makes you even more guilty. Who understands what I'm saying? Good, 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 good. There's a pretty young lady over there, okay. I'd like to know, how would we know when we need to meditate? How would we, you know? Well, you, you're here, aren't you? Yeah. Why are you here? Because you need observe. to... observe. You're here because you want to learn to meditate? I'm interested. Good. I want to know. You've answered your own question. <coughs> uh, let me ask you, the, well, let me put it even simpler. Um, are you awake or asleep right now? I'm awake. You, you now, how do you know that you're awake? Who told you? No. You, you see that. You see that you're awake, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Good. So in other words, how do you know anything? You know because you, you see that. You see it. See? You, you, you know if you're sick, you need a remedy. So if your soul is sick and things aren't going right, you need something. Eventually identify it. It's a meditation. It's a means of coming to God. When you stop playing God, you can do that. See, because everything else short of that is playing God. Well, we live in our imagination and we, plan to, we think we're something we're not. But anyway, that's another story. Okay, anybody else have any questions? A, a lady over there, thank you very much. Would you please stand? Are you ranking serial number? How can you... <laughs> pardon me? No, I was just joking. <laughs> uh, how can you get the right kind of, uh, say, self-worth or self-esteem or a good feeling about yourself if you've been say, put down and degraded and rejected all of your life, and uh, how, how can you get that without it being, say, egotistical or something like that? Well, uh, yeah, that's true, uh, but that's really a question for another oh. part of the discussion, but uh, you do it through the meditation, because there's no such thing, there's two types of self-esteem. One, self-esteem. Me. You know, Mr. Wonderful, you walk around as if, and everybody accords you that, you, it reacts accordingly, and you have the power to pull, pull that respect out of them, see? 
and make people feel guilty if they don't. Mothers sometimes know how to do that, don't they? So, and then your whole life is, but it's a false self-esteem, wouldn't you agree? We don't want any false self-esteem because what kind of a self-esteem that's based upon what people think of you and the illusions of your own thinking, or your own self, what kind of self-esteem is it when you're dependent upon the crowd? See, I mean, what kind of pride is that that is a slave of, of what people think of you? See, that has to grub in the dirt sometimes for it. It's not much of a self-esteem, is it? So, um, and then there's, uh, of course, some people get a self-esteem by, by knocking down others and destroying the self-esteem of other people, knocking themselves down to build themselves up. But you are addicted to knocking down in order to have self-esteem. There was that kind of self-esteem that's worldly. But because both self-esteems are bad. So you the loser and them the winner haven't got anything. They haven't got it, but you think they do. So, and you think, and you're jealous, of, or you only resent them because they have what you seem not to have. See, and you must realize that they don't have it. Because part of your problem, your self-esteem problem is, is resenting what others appear to have and what you, what you don't. Jealousy. See, coveting that quality. Resenting them. A lot of people, you know, resent other people for being rich. See, they only resent others for rich because, being rich because they have what they don't have. See? And uh, I think the point is made though, right? There's two kinds of self-esteem. There's the kind of self-esteem I just spoke about. And, but, but both parties, the one that knocks down and destroys the self-esteem of others, and the one that seems to have it, neither one of them, you know, the one that seems to have it never has. And the one who doesn't have it, like yourself, is jealous and angry and hateful of what others have done to them and envious of others who have it. See, because in the presence of other, others, they always seem to be able to pull themselves up, knock you down and make you worse. See, and that's because you're caught up in this envy and resentment whenever it happens to you. I suggest that you not be resentful anymore and give up your anger, give up your envy and see that it's by your own weakness that you've lost your self-esteem. See, self-esteem is, is strength flowing from within you. And you had it, you had the potential of it when you were a little child. And but because you've been abused and hurt and degraded, and you resented, you see, and you overreacted through the resentment, then the world has able to make you what they wanted you to be. See, they made you a support for their self-esteem by knocking you down. See, every, because it's obviously they, they don't have it. It's the same with a coward. He doesn't have... Uh, bullies are not really bully... Uh, r bullies are really cowards in bully form because every bully is a coward to another bully. So, so everybody who has self-esteem really is uh, somebody's fall guy. And they've just turned around and make good out of you and you have been created you exist. Your personality has been formed by the pressures of those types of people to serve that interest, to maintain this illusion. Somebody has to be wrong so they can be right. Somebody has to be down so they can be up. You follow that? Because that's the way the ego lives by comparison. But again, we're getting away from meditation. And uh, we only got two minutes. Do, do, do you realize that another half an hour went by? <laughs> yeah. Well, could you just hang, 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 hang on? Hang on for a while because we're going to make a station break. But uh, we did get away from the subject. But true self-esteem is being true to yourself. You see? And that's what the meditation is all about. To bring you back, and for you it's going to be a long way because I can see the look on your face. So you've got to come back a long way because you've been put down and you've also put yourself down. See, When there isn't anybody put you down, you put yourself down. See, because... Well, there's a psychological reason and I haven't got time to go into that. But you've got to stop doing that to yourself. You have to stop hating people in your mind. Because anything that goes wrong with your life, you'll see, you're going you're to start flashing on the people who put you down and, and, and set you on this path to being unsuccessful. 
and having a low opinion of yourself. So you can always blame them, and blame is hate, and hate is fixation, and it's the form of hypnosis. It's a form of hypnosis that keeps you negative, keeps you obliging the authorities that have done it to you in the past and in the future. So you have to defocus your attention. And for you it would be defocusing from your hate, from your resentments. They have you in a swirl, right? Ladies and gentlemen, um, the time has gone very quickly. I didn't get to discuss all what I wanted to discuss, but tomorrow, uh, if you want to be in our audience, it's Friday nights as a rule, please call the number on the, on the screen during the daytime and uh, get the material, the meditation, to teach you how to be objective and in control of your emotions. Join you tomorrow night. Part four is next. Hello, my name is Roy Masters, and it's, the program is Roy Masters is talking about you. And Well, we're talking about meditation, and, um, and I'm trying to stay to the subject as closely as I can, but in our last segment we got into this thing of self-esteem and uh, how that can be best brought about if people have been degrading you all your life. How does meditation bring you back to that self-esteem? And all we need to do is understand one simple thing. Um, there's a lot, as the gentleman said a few minutes ago, um, you, you want to say it now about what you were saying? I was saying that... I was saying you can that just, you can just talk, you can, you can talk normally. Excellent. Just talk to me. That the field of psychiatry, whenever people go to a psychiatrist, right. The first thing the psychiatrist is working on is what? How's your self-esteem? It's terrible. It's down. You're negative. You're depressed. We don't want to build it up, though. You don't want to build it up because it's a lie. that's the worst thing that you could do. You get it's fixated into your own lie, it's, it'll destroy and then you become dependent on people who reinforce the lies. Positive thinking makes you dependent upon a positive thinking church. See, and then you glorify this lying, this big liar, who helps you to forms your thoughts for you. And as long as you're see, everybody have these dark thoughts. And there's two ways to, to deal with dark thoughts. You, 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 you inter interrupt the flow from where they're coming. You interrupt where they're coming from by the proper process of meditation. Or you turn the dark thoughts into bright thoughts by, keep, by when, whenever you have a bad thought, you think you place it with a good one. See? See? And you, then you have an amnesia about your bad thoughts, but your bad thoughts are still coming from a dark place, and they're still moving you, just because you can't see it. Doesn't mean to say it's not affecting you, and affecting other people through you. And you wonder why, because you're really a hypocrite. So your children see through your pretense. Have you ever seen a salesman give you a, a canned sales pitch where you know he's learned these positive things and he's so mechanical like a wound up robot? And you, he doesn't see, he thinks he's, he's coming on to you strong and doing, he thinks his self-esteem is as high as it can be and he's gonna make some sales. All it does is turn you off. At the, at the very best, he can hope for is somebody who's weak enough to get caught up in that, and then he thinks he's successful. All he's got is a victim, but he himself is a victim. See, because he now thinks he's accomplished something. Therefore, but he's only knocks, he's only destroyed and taken advantage of some poor sucker who didn't know how to deal with it. See, so that's not self-esteem, is it? So I want to do away with the notion of self-esteem. What is self-esteem? It's in integrity. You cannot have self-esteem with it without a pure bond between uh, what you were when you were born, the evolution of the self that was there when you were born. But you were taken away from that. So that any problem that you have, it doesn't matter what problem you have, all human problems, every problem of, of, of yours and your problems of interrelating with others and inter others interacting with you, which will also be wrong, is wrong because you have fallen away from integrity. You've fallen away from the ground of your original pure and simple growth of innocence. Being just being your natural self. Now you'd know if I was rehearsing behind, the, um, in my office or, you know, rehearsing these speeches, you know that these are just coming spontaneously from me. I don't rehearse anything. I don't know what's going to happen next. And, uh, you know, I'm, it's impromptu, spontaneous. You must be like that, but you don't live like that. You live either by impulse, which you excuse, and therefore to avoid impulse, you think something out very carefully so that it happens the way you, you plan it, so nothing goes wrong, but then it doesn't match the situation, so you feel silly and awkward. 
You pl even plan conversations that don't work out. If he says that to me, I'll say that to him. And finally, you, you go up to him and he smiles at you and it blows them all away. Right? So, so you can't live like that. You need the impromptuness of things. I don't think that says it right, but impromptuness, if there's such a word. And, and it needs to rise naturally and originally from within you. It must be your idea to love, your idea to give. See, it must be your discoveries and your inner self that express from the fullness of the heart the mouth speaks and the body acts. So, that is integrity, to be true to your word, to be honest, not to force, not to let our others make you promise things which is not your own idea. See? Um, but to, to be responsible and to know, to, to be to response able, to be response able, to be able to respond to what you know is right. But that hasn't happened. That quality in you was degraded in you. And you've either been, uh, you've either been, your self-esteem is either destroyed or it was built up falsely because you may feel inferior and you may compensate with a superiority quality, a superiority complex if there's such a thing. A lot of people have it. Hello, how are you? You see people have this quality about them that, you know, that you know, they're, they're acting out of a s superficial personality substitute for what was original, right? And they're locked into that. That all has to be broken down. If you want real self-esteem, that's not self-esteem. See? So what we, what we need from you is to get back to the original ground of being and repair the breach and start to grow. And you have to give up the hate, the resentment, you, that, that, and, the, and the fixation to your past memories. You, aren't you fixed to your past memories? And every, and, and, and every time somebody puts you down, it becomes another past memory to be fixated to, so you become bitter and not better? Yes. Um, I just wanted to add, Go add ahead. on to that. Uh, I've had this problem for like 25 years almost, since I was about 12 or 13, that um, it was hard for me to just look at people like I'd get really scared. A fear like would come over me. Well, you feel self-conscious. Like, I feel like it's like my nose is this big, you know, and like people are staring well, yes, at me. Yes, well, you're self, it's called self-consciousness. Now, let me, let me uh, um, illustrate it with a biblical original version of that. Ad Adam was in the garden only three hours when he ate of the forbidden fruit, and he fell from his, fell from his original estate, and, and he had to wear fig leaves. And they, they made aprons of fig leaves and they wore it around their waists. They were self-conscious. That's what you're feeling. And the more wrong you are, and you're very wrong, you're very guilty, aren't you? You have a, you have a, very, a lot of self-consciousness about you, don't you? You have a lot of inferiority. Mm -hmm. And it's because you're so angangry and so resentful, you've begun to feel inferior. Because resentment is, a rea is an inferior reaction to an inferior external will. So, first of all, the will on the outside that's causing you to resent it, the injustice, has caused a ripple. So you are the effect of a cause. You are the effect of the wrong cause. You become a wrong person. And then as you become a wrong person, it's just like Adam, all he did was respond to the temptations in his mind. And then, of course, he did it. He ate of the fruit with his body. But the moment his mind got locked into the temptation, is intent, tangled, and, and involved itself with the, te with the temptation. Because you know, there's something about lies and seduction that our, spirit, our souls are fascinated with. It doesn't take only an emotional response. There are many levels of, 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 of locking into temptation. You're, the way you get locked into temptation is you, you respond emotionally and angrily and resentfully. You react, you respond. And in your response, which is first of all a physical response, an emotional one, it pulls your consciousness down in it because you're wrong to respond. Your response is na namely resentment and judgment. Thinking like you're ugly, that kind of thing. Well, but you're becoming ugly. I don't mean to be rude, but when you respond with, to, to evil, to cruelty, 
and to stress and to put downs, you're responding to somebody who's ugly, who's trying to make themselves beautiful by making you more ugly. You're becoming ugly, ugly and you're obliging them. You are becoming ugly. You get, <laughs> I don't mean to be rude, but inside you are. Even if somebody were to give, me, give you a compliment, you wouldn't believe it. You'd know that you think they were lying, and that would upset you. Is that correct? Sounds good. <laughs> you see? It sounds right, doesn't it? See, so that nothing could ever make you happy in this world. Because you know in your own self you're, you're, you're troubled and you're, you feel ugly inside. And that has to be remedied. But the thing that must be remedied is your reaction, which is your resentment, which is your sin, which is your pride. See? See, your, your, your soul, your soul comes, it follows the emotion. It's like a whirlpool. It gets sucked in from the, from the, the temptation to resent somebody. And, and your sin is one of emotion, one of resentment and judgment. Where Adam's sin was in, uh, he started in his mind. Adam started in his mind. So it, it, the sin could start in the consciousness, but once the sin, once, let's, let's take it, let's play it a little bit. Once Adam, in his consciousness, bought the lie, he believed into it. See? He got, you know, when, when you believe something, it's into you. If you believe in God, God is into you, and you are into God, see? And then you have his life in you, and you have his ways and his character. But if you believe a lie, that's what Adam did, he bought a lie because of his pride. Pride, he wanted to be something he could never be, God. But it started in his mind, and the moment he believed what he should not have believed, he found himself joining his consciousness with the, the spirit, of the external world. And that separated him from the ground of his original brain, and he lost self-esteem. He became, he became self-conscious. He, he, not he noticed that there was something wrong with his, with his altered state. His altered state of consciousness produced a reciprocal altered state of being. All altered states of consciousness produce a symptom which you become conscious of. First of all, your hands feel big, your nose feels big, amongst other things. See, everything feels, you feel self-conscious. And then you start to be sick and you start to notice that. And then you feel, you walk awkward. You're very, you see? Everything starts to be awkward, and, and, and the, the longer, lower you sink, the more it produces symptoms, symptoms to be awkward about. And then pretty soon symptoms become ugliness or disease, which makes you even feel more awkward and ugly. See? But his sin started in the mind. But it separated him from the inner ground of being so that he could no longer grow as a man, as a man should. But he grew now subject to the emotional pressures of his environment because that now it didn't require. His relationship with the world didn't require that he believe lies anymore. Not if he, because now the evil or the temptation had him. All they had to do now is, because he was a reactive animal, because now he was subject to the creature, not the creator. See, he was a, subject to his environment, the outer one, not the inner one. So all, all you'd have to do is torment him, excite him, and he'd react. He'd get upset. See? And like you do, you were born subject to your environment. You didn't originally start to do wrong, but you've inherited the, 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 the gravitational effect of original sin. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm so now, no, what I'm saying, let me finish the point. Okay. <laughs> and the point is, just to make it clearly, that you, your, your physical reaction, your emotional reaction, your resentment to injustice is what's separating, is pulling your consciousness with it. It's, in other words, the more you get upset, the more you are obeying. It's, it's, almost, it's a form of believing, isn't it? If you believe and obey, or if you obey and don't believe, see, it, you're still, still subject to the creature and not the creator. You're subject to the will of that thing, and your soul is involved. See? And you don't want to believe, and you don't want to do what it wants you to do, but nevertheless, it still acts through you, doesn't it? When you react and you get upset, you find yourself going along with what people want you to do, or doing things you know you shouldn't do. Your soul is involved with those emotions, and your soul is becoming ugly and poisoned. It's becoming deformed. And the world is seeping into you, because it's acting through you and you can't be as God wants you to be.
You follow that? And that's why you feel inferior. Inferiority and loss of self-esteem has something to do with you reacting to the world with resentment around you so that you are the effect of a wrong cause. And being the effect of a wrong cause, you're growing in a way that's wrong. And the only way you could have self-esteem is by kidding yourself, by knocking others down, building yourself up, that sort of thing, by pretending, pretense, self-deceit, which won't do for you. What you must understand is you have a very severe emotional state. Does that mean you need an exorcism or something? Well, exorcism will be discussed yeah. in another <coughs> subject, but you've got to become purified. And your purification, and this mostly, is to repent of your sin of anger, which is, pr pr you still, pride is still involved. See, resentment is the handmaiden of pride. First of person is prideful, and he, he becomes tempted by forbidden things. So it's a mental thing, or a spiritual thing. But once he has crossed the border, and partaken of the forbidden delight, done the wrong thing, he no longer has the emotion of love, which is really not, a, it's re it's really not an emotion as we know it. It's a calmness, a coolness, something that can never, you never be ruffled and never be disturbed, never be shaken. Some, something of a quality you'd admire in a person, wouldn't you? You see, a, like a Colonel North, you couldn't shake him. There's this high discipline. But this comes from having high self-esteem, having high integrity, lots of belief in self, the original self, called faith. And that self having grown in him and speaking through him. So that, that the contrast is between the creator and the creature, not the creature and the, and the, and, and the, the temptation. It's the environment. Right now you're just the creature and, and, and the subject to the, the, the bigger creatures, see, the creation. You're subject to this. And what it was started out only to be a mental thing of pride. But once pride lost the ground of its being, it no longer had the energy or the strength to resist anything. And the natural internal energy, which we call love, the natural flow, the natural calmness. But now it has to be upset to deal with things. Ah. See, we, in our primitiveness, in our ignorance, think that if we're angry and upset, we can make things right. We can be stronger than the other fellow. But it is not so, because we're only growing as an animal, not a person. So that the angrier you get, the more you are subject to the creature, not the creator. And the more you grow to be a creature of the creature, and not a creature of the creator. See? What I'm, who understands what I'm talking about? You do, don't you? I don't think you've ever had explained that to you before. But you've only got that, and you must give up anger. You and then if you give up resentment, and seeing that in the light of reality, that that's not the way to go. That you must not be afraid not to be angry. See, there's a part of you that's afraid not to be angry, because you think you're going to give in to that person. That if you're not angry and upset, that's giving in. No, it's just the opposite. Being angry and resentful is giving in. Do you see that? It's just the opposite. The, oh, because as long as you're resentful and angry, you're using the, your, your earthy powers, your ego powers, to overcome another ego. But then it's, it's two egos evolving each other. So it, either you become, you know, you are, the, you are the beast or the slave of the beast. And if you're the slave of the beast, you'll turn around and find your own slave. And there you, how you get your self-esteem. It's earthy and, e and creature-like, cruel, evil. Follow that? That's what we have, this dog-eat-dog -dog world out there. And you've been born subject to that, young lady. And I'm saying, you have a hypnotic fixation now to, to you've, been, you've grown pridefully out of emotion. Because that's how your creature's self came in. And this creature self knows no other way except being angry and upset at injustice, thinking you're going to conquer injustice by being upset with it. You become injustice. And then suddenly you find that you are self-conscious you've grown to be what you've hated. Is that right? See? That's why Christ taught these principles. Overcome evil with good. See? Don't overcome evil with evil. Don't, don't injustice with injustice, hate with hate. Don't respond. Love. See? Love your enemy. 
Overcome evil with good. Resist not evil. Means, translate it, if we had the right translation now, it would be resent not evil. Because you want to resist it, of course, you, otherwise you're going to give in to it. So that's a wrong word. Resent not. Don't resist it that way. See? Now the meditation is going to teach you to give up the resistance, which is of resentment, which makes you obey the creature, the will of the creature, and to grow in the likeness of the will of the creature <coughs> instead of the Creator, and cause you great puzzlement as to why this is happening. Yeah, but it's the only way you know how to do it. So when you hate the creature, you feel guilty for hating him because you know better than he is. So if you can't lick him, you join him. And you love him. You have a love-hate relationship. And you confuse between the two. See? This is what we call love when you start to join and lick the boots of people who have violated you, and hurt you, give in to them, thinking that now you have love when you have slavery. See? Now, am I making sense here? Now that's why you particularly must meditate to... We've got away from all the... I, I started out talking about meditation, but you guys have suckered me into... <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to bring it back on the track. Um, you must give up your fixation to your resentments, because you're locked... Those are your mistakes. How do you know if you even have it, though? I mean, I well, you, you're not meditating, are you? Well, I am. You just started? Well, no, I've been doing it for quite a while. You haven't been doing it right. <laughs> it's um, where, you know, you keep that space between... Are you giving up resentments? Well, I didn't know. I, I mean, it's You didn't hard. know you had them. See? Yeah, I know. They're well, then you must be, If you don't have any resentments, I'm going to... Bring, a, bring, bring in they're a big there. fish tank. Bring it, I'm going to put her on to see if she can walk on water. No, <laughs> they're there. I just, you know, I, I just covered me. up. Uh, yes, of course they're covered up, but you're never going to find them until you're objective to them. And you haven't... You haven't found that objectivity. It's clear that you haven't found it. Talking about fish tanks, there's this story of this fellow who was in the courtroom with a great big fish tank and has his client walking on the top of the water of this fish tank and he's saying to the, saying to the jury, he says, now do you think he's guilty? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I have observed a something during my daily, you know, doing things. Besides, you know, you can't meditate all day long. And there's things that you yes, can, you can. Do. You must, well, must, you must meditate you can, unceasingly. Okay, well, I don't mean it Eventually. that way. I understand. But what I'm saying is that I found uh, a system that you can use. Uh, I, I observe that the language we use, just the words we use, we're traumatized by words. We're affected of by words. Of course we are. That's another subject again. For example, uh, we use a lot in our language. Everybody does all day long. They say, I feel this. I feel that this should be this. I feel. Exactly, exactly. So they use the word feel. Everything comes from feeling. Is that right? You, okay. you hear him, don't you? All right. Instead of using the feel, forget that word. Start dropping it and say, I observe this. I but, see this. But you should that also, uh, by the same token, if you're going to do that, you must simply alert people to the fact that they are doing that. And you should say, do you feel that or do you know that? Do you feel it? Do you know it because you feel it? Because it could be deceiving you, young man. See? You could start being, uh, um, making them aware by the fact that you are. And when you do that, you are teaching them to meditate. You'd, you're projecting in the right way. You're quite correct. Maybe that is a form of meditation. Oh, yes, it is. Okay, Anytime so your awareness yeah. acts upon another person in a, by way of correcting them, it's called love. See? You're trying to awaken them to their own potential. And but you're trying to make them aware of their own folly of their involvement, with hypnotic involvement with feeling, as he says. Now, now, I notice that people are traumatized to uh, things like, you know, the, the man that uses four-letter words all day long, he's yes. traumatized to those words all the yes, time. Right. And he's emotionally, as a person, as an individual, he becomes that, those four-letter words. He is that. Why do you think a person uses four-letter words? Why do you think people laugh over body functions? passing gas and things like that. <laughs> Why do you think they do that? They laugh, you know, it's always a joke. <laughs> so, see, what, 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 why, do you think they, why do you think they use four-letter words and swear and... Pull your mind down. It, it does. He said it, the man, gentleman said it right now. It, it, you have low words which associate with foul 
uh, experiences because you see the lower you sink the lower you have to sink to see that you haven't sunk to, to, see, to see that you've sunk to avoid seeing that you've sunk see, the lower you sink the lower you must sink to avoid seeing that you've sunk got it? Mm -hmm. Whew, I sure. thought I'd never say that. <laughs> <laughs> but words, words identify with mm -hmm. the, 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 the practice of our lives. Right. Of course, words lead, lead to practice, too. You, th you think lowly and you do lowly, and, 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 the, and the fantasy leads to the experience, and the experience reinforces the fantasy, doesn't it? See, so, the, I, the people who have foul language need the lowly language because they've got to keep themselves from knowing what is higher, lest they should feel guilty. Mm. See, an insecure. It's a for, It's a again another hypnotic state. It's another kind of sort of self hypnosis. It's a, it's a meditation because meditation. The, the world. Listen, I haven't got time. I got one minute. <laughs> you know, he holds up a one minute sign, and I'm in a minute trying to do a heavy thing. So we have to do this heavy thing tomorrow. And tomorrow, will you join us? Because it does get interesting, and if you want to join us in the, the group, Friday nights is when we have it here. You can call the number on the end of the program and make a, make a reservation so you can sure to get in. We don't have too many takers, as you can see, but <laughs> come anyway. You're welcome to come. And, um, tomorrow evening, we're going to have another program. And please you learn to meditate. Learn to, in a special way, not ordinary meditation. It's on the screen, and support the program with your contribution and your tithes. Thank you for listening and join us again. Part 5 is next. The foundation of human understanding teaches an observation exercise, often called meditation, which permits you to become objective toward your problems and allows your heartaches, bad habits, fears and anxieties to be completely eliminated from your life without effort on your part. Until you have begun to practice this exercise, much of what you see and hear on the following program may be shocking and upsetting to you. But if you will listen calmly and with an open mind, you may discover the key to the peace of mind and joy for which you've been searching all of your life. And now from the foundation of human understanding, here is Roy Masters. Well, hello, welcome once again to our program. Um, Roy Masters is talking about you and I really meant to talk about meditation this week, and I got off to a very good start. Two programs on that subject, and then <laughs> everything, all hell broke loose. <laughs> but of course, the object of meditation is to solve problems, so it's only natural, I suppose, that as I start talking about meditation and becoming objective and separating from your thoughts and feelings, that you are going to start seeing what your problems are made of. See, and, uh, and so that's what the pr program has sort of become. Uh, the last program where we were talking about people's problems. We were talking about self-esteem, and we were talking about uh, how, we got, how we get back our original self-esteem. And I said that, that self-esteem that comes from compensation, from positive thinking, from knocking others down to build yourself up, from riches, compensation. It's not really self-esteem. Self-esteem is coming back to our original roots of integrity and being right with ourselves. And it boils down to meditation. And meditation is not a cure of anything. You can't cure anything with meditation. Meditation is not a cure. It's, it's the vehicle where you get from one side of the river to the other, where you go from um, East Germany, subject to the rulership there, the tyranny, to West Germany, where there's sort of freedom of sorts. And so you pass from one, the soul, you're, two, you're, you're, you're somebody else in there. You're not just a body. There's somebody, somebody home. And a lot of people, there's nobody home. The lights are still on, but nobody's home, you know what I mean, for the most part. <laughs> and, uh, but you're in, in there listening to me, and, and, and you're subject to East Germany right now, many of you. Because, you know, if you're, it's where your soul is, where you, where you happen to be is where you, your influences come from. You can't help but obey the laws of East Germany, as cruel as they are. Or if you live in the, in the, under, under Ayatollah, you'd have to live under those loot because everybody else is. You're swept along with it whether you like it or not. 
You either have to change the society you live in, or you have to get the hell out of there. So you see, you've got to get the hell out of yourself. Because that, in a, in a manner of speaking, I'm not being crude, I say that. It's as though you are. The hell is in within you. And you feel it. And it's acting through you. And you have to become objective, and that's what meditation is for. To defocus, to watch thoughts, the past mostly, and of ambitions of the future. Because, see, it, you, you have a mind, uh, and, uh, and it's always thinking of past and future. It's relative to time. And, uh, but the soul shouldn't be subject to time the pressures of time. But the minute you have, you have goals, you have dreams, and you dream away yourself from reality through dreaming go goals. What is a goal but a sp something uh, in a point of time which you move toward, but you also move away from the timeless one? There's a timeless place within yourself, and that's where everything should flow from. But in your pride, you have a goal. All goals are vain, aren't they? To be what you want to be and to have what you and to dress yourself up in the the the, the, the pleasures of your attainments, in the gloriousness of it. Say, look at me, everybody. So you you're attaining things and you're setting goals to achieve. And what you're doing is creating a self out of moving away from self. And you find yourself subject to environment and, and the environment begins to seep in and create the personality. See? The false self. That is, and, the, and it's like you're being in East Germany. You're subject to another dimension. You've fallen away from, the, from what you might have been. And you're subject to the creature and not the creator. And, and this is what meditation is all about, to try to get back to where you were before any falling took, took place. To become objective. There's only two places you can be, and it's like an aeroplane being on the ground, or it's in the air. When it's on the ground, it's subject to the laws of the ground, and when it's, subject, when it's in the air, it's subject to the laws of the air. What you want to do is get off the ground. You want to pull away from the gravity of, of the world you live in, but you have to give up ambition. Your only goal must be, your only must goal must be, is to serve what you were created to serve, to find your creator and to serve, and you know, to, to find out what you're here for, and to have it manifest in you, to serve, to surrender. That's your only goal. If it's any other goal, you're somewhere looking out on the horizon, away from the inner, moving towards the outer, and falling away from the inner, and being shaped by the outer. Who understands that? See? Become subject to it. Whether you like it or not after a while, See, once the initial fall has taken place, you're subject emotionally. And the chief emotion is resentment. Yes, well, there's a f the person who's a call, call over there. <laughs> you, you stand up. Yeah, and the gentleman will speak after that. I was just, um, when you were talking about goals, I could see that goals is, is a way to propel you from one point to the other to make you feel like... Uh, you're moving, like you're accomplishing something. You've got to keep moving. See, p human beings, in, in their egos, have to move, always reach beyond their grasp. Why do they do that? See, because, they have, because reaching beyond the grasp is an enticement, the object that you reach for, the object of desire to make one prideful, is, is always has to be beyond one's grasp because you need to focus your attention on the horizon and move towards it. Why does that happen? So you move away from self. You're moving away from guilt. When you're moving away from guilt, you see, you're moving towards the growth of the ego. The development of the creature self. You know, the beast who would be king. See? <laughs> yeah, that's what you're doing. So therefore, there are a lot of people who set goals that are beyond their reach, that they can never reach it. Because they're afraid if they do reach it, they'd have to stop still. And the truth would catch up with them. No one could ever reach their goals. You'd always have to set a higher one. Because you're never going to be happy with a goal that you have. Because in order to bear the pain of what you've become, reaching those goals, 
you have to have another goal to, to reach away from, to fixate your mind and move away from the truth of what you've become. You can't sit still. You have to move and know yourself rather than be still and know yourself. See? Who understands me? Now I tell you that all things will come towards you. For instance, in science, we have a thing called relativity. And it, it's, in other words, Einstein s says that it's just as easy for you to say that when you're going to New York, that New York is coming to you. you it sounds silly, but if you're out in space and everything's, you know, something is moving towards you, well, how do you know which one is moving towards what? Is this one still and this one moving? Or is this one still and this one moving? Or are they both moving together? It depends on what frame of reference. You can say in the universe, when you're going out into space towards the stars, the stars are actually coming to you and you're not lying. It depends on your frame of reference because there is no ultimate frame of reference as far as science is concerned in the universe. But I tell you, there is an ultimate rel relevance inside yourself. And if you find that ultimate relative, then instead of having you to go out towards your goals, your goals will come towards you. Everything will come your way. You see how that, do you feel yourself tingle just then? Yeah. See, it struck home. Don't be afraid, they'll come. Just be still and they will come to you. In a sense, it's relative. You, it, it, you'll be working and you're doing, you'll, for all intents and purposes, you'll be like everybody else, working and, and making and shaping and going to and fro, fro and gardening and hoeing and raking and reaping and sowing, but it won't be the same thing because you'll always be moving out of yourself and not away from yourself. Because if everything you got, you had to get from moving away from yourself so that you're not yourself but you're something else, you're not going to be happy with it or yourself. Is that right? Yeah, this is good stuff. I don't write it all down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this gentleman... Um, Okay, you could just... Getting to the point where uh, realizing your purpose. Yes. If people can it really... You know, we're happen. far away from meditation now, aren't we? <laughs> That's true. That's all right, uh, then. But you, you were talking about reach, finding your purpose, which everybody on the earth should have. Reach, they should know, where, where, why are we here? Yes. We should know. Is it, the question would be, is it possible to exist in this system in that state of mind? I just said it was possible. Is it possible? See, because I didn't know... Forty years ago, when I was sitting, cutting diamonds in a factory, a sweatshop, 15 years old. How, how many get 45 years ago, yeah, 45 years ago. Shh, that gives you my age. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I didn't know I was going to be sitting here, you know, well, I don't say that the foundation is a big empire, but it's 30 people working for the foundation. and We've got a lot of work to do. So I'm the president of, I'm my own pope, actually. <laughs> but anyway, I didn't know I'd be doing this. I didn't dream it. I didn't create it. I just did what I know what was right and put one foot in the front of the other according to the guidance that was given me because I loved the truth more than anything else. And when I was a little boy, the first thing I n remember saying when I became conscious I existed. You know those moments when you... This, that cosmic consciousness where you suddenly become awake out of a dream when you're a kid and you're here. And where you, a few mo moments ago you were in a dream. And for most of our lives lived in dreams. But you have moments of awakening and it feels odd. And when those moments, the first thing I, I asked when I became aware, when I was very small, why am I here? I knew I was here for a purpose. You are too. In this, but I didn't jump into my dream again. I just knew that it was the right kind, it, the, answer, the question rose to me and the question even itself came from God because not even that question can come from yourself. Do you understand that? Not even your false desires can come, you can't originate them, they have to be tempted into you. It, somebody puts a desire in you for them, but you think it's your own desire for them. And I was aware that the, even now that the desire I had for God didn't come from me, it came from God, originally. See? And every person who, who awakens from his dream and asks the question naturally, I can't tutor you with that, you see. 
If you've ever asked the question, you've got it. It came from God, and, 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 and if, if that's what you want, if, that's what you're, if that mingles with your original intent, you're, on your, you're, you're actually on your way. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Because you couldn't have had that thought had you not been compatible with God and God's own from the very beginning. See? You couldn't have received it. Because after all, your soul is nothing else but a receptacle. It isn't much. It's only compatible with good or not. And then it forms from there, good or evil. See that? <laughs> See? It's only a compatibility, an inclination of the soul, or an intent. Soul isn't anything, it just reflects the environment that it's, a, that it's compatible with. Good men reflect good in their lives. They become good people. And bad people reflect their master. You see it? You see it in them. There's two human beings, one's beautiful and one's wicked. Yet they're both human beings and they have different destinies. Don't you see all this? Good and evil at work. And, and uh, again, we've got away from meditation, but what is the meditation for but to bring you the, the journey of the perfect, the journey to perfection? See, because it makes the journey, it's, a, it is, it's, a, it's the technology of the journey. It's the technology of putting, moving towards West Germany, away from East Germany. So I teach you to come across the border, to become objective. Because there's only two spaces inside you to occupy. You're either in your thoughts, where the world is, where you're in the world and of the world, see? Or objective to your thoughts, where God is, where you're in Him and He is in you. Bingo. You have two different identities. And these two identities are completely diametrically opposed to one another. When you hate yourself, very often, not always, it's not a complete thought, but part of, partly when you hate yourself is because there's a self in you that you don't want to be. And the self, the self hates you. It, the self, the, the true self loves wisdom. And the false self loves trivia. Ball gays and hot dogs and all kinds of junk that you think is wonderful. See, that it's caught up in, because it's made of that, and it loves that, and it, reinf like it reinforces itself in that like a pig in the trough, right? So, I guess all the baseball fans are going to get disturbed with me, and <laughs> I won't be on the air tomorrow or something, you know? Did you see now, what I'm saying now, you become objective, because when you, wherever you can become objective, even if it's only for a very short time, the fifth the second, as I said, even if you can hold yourself apart from yourself, the other wrong self, only for a split second, something magical happens. In that moment of separation, where it ha happens, something comes into you that is the making of the new you. Be ye therefore transformed through the renewing of your mind from within. And there's another part which talks about the casting down of vain imaginations and bringing every thought into the captivity of Christ, right? right. Isn't that right? Now you're beginning to understand the meaning of all this. We must become objective because then you are in the character of our Creator. And His character is in you. But failing that to the degree that you are not doing that, not coming to him through the technology of the meditation, then you are failing that, you are automatically involved, continue resigning your will to the will of the world. You can't help yourself. If your intent is to find the truth, you can recognize the means to come across. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, any person who wants to get across East Germany is going to look for a hole in the fence. Is that right? From, he wants to come from East Germany to West Germany, he's going to look for a way He's going to find that way to move across. Meditation is that way. And there any questions? Yes, sir. You just talk to me and ignore that 
heathen over there. Um, when I'm, when I'm uh, attempting to meditate. You might get a little closer to him, I think. Yes, my voice is kind of weak. I'm He's kind a bit wimpy. Kind of wimpy. Like <laughs> 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 but I, I bet you can get really mad and you got stronger than you look. Um, Am I right? Yes. You're sometimes yes, afraid of your own that's, anger? That's when I get angry. Um, you're afraid of your own anger because you might hurt somebody because you're stronger than you look. Well, I'm afraid I, I would kill someone. See, I picked that up on you, didn't I? I we from the other side know these things. I got into fights when I was little because I see why now. I, I really, I wouldn't fight to... But what, what happens now, I'll tell you what else that happens. Because you are that way and very violent, you've let people walk all over you because you're afraid. And you let people do things that you try not to be angry with them, right? Yes. But I you ended up trying. being angry with any anyway, don't you? Yes. And hurting yourself. See? Okay. My question about the meditation... That's an observation from West Germany. <laughs> <laughs> My question about the meditation is that I don't always have warm hands and... and what, I'm saying is, what I'm saying is you are not, you're not as wimp as you appear to be. You've only made yourself a wimp so to avoid being angry. Because you're afraid you might kill somebody. Yes. You, you, you're quiet. Yes. See? Don't fight anybody if you can avoid arguments. I sound can. very, I try to sound very pleasant and pleasing. Yes, I know. There you go, there you go. You pick up, that, pick up on that? Okay, now you go on with your question. I don't, I don't always have um, light and, and warmth, light in my forehead and warmth in my hands together during the meditation. Um, that was, I, that's only happened very rarely with me. But it does happen, has happened. Strive for it. It has happened just yeah, very the, the way, briefly. Let me say this. The meditation is correct when your hands tingle warm. Or the palms of your hands, when held together like this, you can feel the heat. You see? And you, you can also concentrate on your feet too. Once you've done that with your hands, you can be aware of your feet. And just be aware of the warmth because as long as you're concentrating correctly, which is becoming dispassionately objective to your thoughts as they go by and not being caught up in thought, there's a flow of energy that starts to flow from within you to your, down to your boots, you see? And with this energy comes understanding. Just like if somebody upset you right now, traumatizes you, a trauma, a very big upset, would cause you to react in comes the energy, right? And along with that comes ideas which you never had before. Who understands that? Mm. It works from within the same way. So you counter your traumas. You find yourself countering your old traumas of life by sitting quietly and not struggling with your problems as if you could, because that's even more trauma. You do that angrily. See? Sitting quietly, and flowing from within, and every time you find yourself wandering off, thinking about the past, and getting, a, getting upset with yourself perhaps, you bring your mind back to the present, because present is where you're supposed to live. Not in the past, not in the future. That's in time present. What you need is time presence. You see, you want to be in the grandstand saluting with all the soldiers going by you. You need to be still, and the life flows by you. But now there's another kind of stillness you can have, is that you can fall into the river. Now the river can flow faster than you, so, re so relative to the river you're still still, but you're caught up in the river and the river's going to take you over the waterfalls one day, or out to sea. You see, the, so you're sitting quietly in the river and the river's going by you and the river's moving faster, but you're still not you're relatively still. You may not observe the current, see. So there's the time present, the present flows by the person floating in the time stream, taking you to some unseen destiny. Or you can come out of time and space, being subject to it, the creation, and become subject to the creator, which means you be still. And, and man is the only creature in the universe, the only creature, that can have a personal relationship with the creator that created the universe, from his stillness. And therefore, he, well, let's make a point. Therefore, he's subject to the timelessness. See, all men are subject to time. And time flows from timelessness be from the very beginning. 
It flows out into all creation. Do you follow that? Cause and effect, effect of becoming cause. And everything is an effect. Cause and effect, and effect becoming cause, and <laughs> cause becoming. But it's all coming from a cause which is itself not an effect of anything. See? And that's the timelessness that creates time. And everything moves in that and, and orbits and cycles and circles and changes and decay. See? Life and death, we call it. Nothing is permanent. But only He who made it all is permanent. And only those who are of Him are eternal. And only man can come back to that beginning because no creature can find the door. And it's not given to him to find the door. That's why you must be still and know that He is God because then you'll see that you've been striving to be Him. And that's why you've been lost in creation. Subject to the creatures and not the Creator. And that is death. Follow? That's the aging process. Right? That is the aging process. You're absolutely right. Continue, sir. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I missed a lot, most of what you're saying because I'm, I'm really in the first stages of meditation. That's I, all right. You're way beyond me. <coughs> but did you... Did, I didn't lose anybody, did I? Some of you had lost. But it was pretty, wasn't it? <laughs> 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 so if... If it's only good for that, it's good for something. If, if, I'm, if I'm seeing more light and my hands are cold, does that mean I'm, I'm focusing too much on the You're on trying too hard. You're trying too hard, and it's not working. We don't want you to try with the meditation. The secret of meditation is untrying. You see, you sometimes your ego is so, so involved that you try not to try. Or you try to relax, so what happens? You become more tense. Your problem is trying, striving after the wind. You have to realize, hey, I don't have to try accomplish anything. I don't have to make anything happen. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen through me. I'm going to be a co-creator, not a creator. You're trying to be a creator. Even when, you, when, even when you create problems, you make a mess, you try to clean it up. But you make a bigger mess, and then you try to clean that up. Then you make a bigger mess trying to clean up the bigger mess and make a bigger mess and then somebody cleans you up. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> a lady just dis discovered herself. <laughs> see, you have to... Anyway, do you see where I'm flowing from? I want you to come to where I'm flowing from. And uh, this two and a half hours together which is five half-hour segments for all the viewers, is, is flowed very quickly because you've lived it, just for a while in eternity. And you know what it's like? Time doesn't mean anything when you write. It only means a lot to people who are not right. They have less time to accomplish more in and they're not going to make it. <laughs> Isn't that right, folks? So now I've explained your problems. Start to meditate with this meditation is like no other. I've spent 45 of my 60 years searching, concentrating on this, and I know my subject well. And you will find the answers in my many books, but the basic book is this one, and uh, How Your Mind Can Keep You Well, and the cassettes, and it flashing on the screen where you can get them. Next week, join us Monday through Friday. We're going to talk more about meditation. We'll pick up where we left off. Thanks for listening. And uh, you've been pretty nice this evening. I appreciate it. This concludes our program.